Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Tun Shen. Uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, of history and also the deputy director of the Sakhir Soban Center for Turkish Studies here at Columbia University. We are very happy to have Dr. Emre Erol from Sabancı University, who will share some portions of his research uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Emre Erol is an assistant professor uh, at Sabancı University, and he is with us uh, as part of a new uh, collaboration between uh, Sabancı University in Istanbul and the site of Sabancı Center for Turkey Studies here at Columbia University. Uh, he's been teaching at Sabancı University a number of courses on history, political science, uh, what else, Emre? World history. World history, yeah. anything you can imagine. <laughs> he's also coordinating, uh, directing um, the Foundation's Development Program at the University, uh, which is the core curriculum uh, program uh, at Sabancı University, Istanbul. Uh, he received his PhD in Leiden University in 2014, uh, where he also worked uh, and taught a number of courses, again, on Middle East studies, history, philosophy, political science, anything you, <laughs> you name it. Uh, he received his MA and BA uh, at Sabancı University, uh, MA in history and BA in social and political science, and uh, we've been a long time friends as we went to the same college, also the same MA program uh, back in 15 years. So let's not yeah. talk about that, the number of years, uh, not to reveal how old we, we are now. Uh, his PhD dissertation uh, was published in 2016 by I.B. Torres entitled The Ottoman Crisis in Western Anatolia. Turkey's belly pop and the transition to a modern nation state. Uh, and Dr. Errol's main research areas are late Ottoman and modern Turkish history, the history of migration and capitalism in the Eastern Mediterranean, nationalisms and comparative area studies. So we are so happy to have you, uh, Emre, and please join me in welcoming him. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to for Thank you uh, for uh, being here uh, for this uh, talk about an empire that doesn't exist it's, <laughs> anymore. So it's still great to attract some uh, experts, at least in the field, uh, still interested in the topic. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, an ongoing research of mine. Uh, in a while, I'm hoping to uh, transfer you this message that it's actually an ongoing project because it's kind of a big data project. Uh, about something that I wanted to do, do years ago when I was doing my PhD, but I didn't have a chance to do at that point in time. Um, I was told that maybe this might be a recording in the future for other audiences as well, so I'm assuming that not everybody who's going to watch this are familiar with the Ottoman Empire, so I'm going to talk uh, on the title, about the title, for a few uh, minutes. I'll try to break down the title uh, for you and this uh, nice visual that I have at the beginning of the presentation. So, uh, let me see if this is like, yes. Uh, my two titles, Displaced People, Displaced People in quotation marks. Uh, this is something that uh, I'm rephrasing from uh, the literature that exists on demographic engineering. Um, I'm going to explain that in a while. Uh, the whole um, idea behind this uh, research project is if the refugee experience, the experience of being displayed, displaced from one place to another forcefully, has an impact on the decision makers' worldview and decisions. And my feeling, which is a feeling based on the existing literature's conclusions so far, is that this happens in multiple occasions in world history, and late Ottoman history could be an example of that. Uh, the second part of the title says, the late Ottoman demographic engineering and the unionist governors. This also needs some explanation, what I mean by late Ottoman, um, of course, uh, you can state uh, to uh, define late Ottoman in a much earlier time period, but my focus today is going to be the period between uh, Ottoman-Italian War, 1911, to the end of uh, the uh, Greco-Turkish War of 1919-1922, which will then result in the establishment of the Young Republic of Turkey. 
Uh, there is a reason behind that focus. Uh, if you say late Ottoman demographic engineering, this might involve a longer time period, but I'm focused on a particular time period for a reason. When you look at Ottoman demographic statistics for the audience who is not initiated with what the Ottoman Empire was, Ottoman Empire was a land-based Afro-Eurasian empire that was being transformed by modern revolutions, if you will, just like most of its contemporaries around the world at that time. And uh, by the latest population census of the Ottoman Empire before the Great War, that is 1914, 25% of this empire consisted of non-Muslims. Uh, but that number is going to be less than 1% when the empire is uh, gone and there's a new nation state in its place. And most of that dramatic demographic change is happening between the years 1911 and uh, 1922, but not exclusively. For instance, there were major issues, for instance, the other massacres of 1909 could be given as an example, or Hamidian massacres uh, before that. But my focus is those 11 years for a reason, which is going to reveal itself in a while. Um, and for those of you who are not, again, immediately familiar with the Ottoman Empire, it is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire in the Near East, which used to govern a very large portion of what you today know as Near East and Middle East. And the last um, half a century of the empire was quite transformative and full of events, to be honest. And especially there's a particular period uh, in the literature we call that the Second Constitutional Revolution, Second Constitutional Period, the period after 1908, the turn of the 20th century, you have a lot of issues going on. And again, for the uninitiated audience, maybe this visual I thought might be a good idea to start with. This is from a well-known um, constitutional era newspaper called Alem from 18th of March, 1909. This is one year after the Second Constitutional Revolution. Second Constitutional Revolution was considered to be a big deal, and it was quite a big deal because this Constitutional Revolution was the first of its kind if I'm not mistaken, outside the global north, uh, one of the earliest of its kind in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. And uh, 1908 uh, was in the minds of those who were, quote unquote, the harbingers of the revolution, was a remedy for all sorts of problems of the empire. But a year after uh, the revolution, in a newspaper like this, um, this says the last uh, state of our constitutional revolution or the last state of our constitutional regime. There's a caricature here, it's a political satire, and it's full of drawings that depict the various ills and troubles uh, that face the empire in that year. In one year's time after the constitutional revolution, there were really a lot of stuff. Bosnia Herzegovina being annexed by Austria Hungary was a big deal. And there was a counter-revolution, there were uh, massacres against Armenian Ottomans, in, primarily Armenian Ottomans, in 1909. Um, there were troubles in what was then known as the Arab provinces. Um, there was a lot of political uh, power struggle between the Revolutionary Party and its opponents. So from the eyes of those who publish that newspaper and those who draw this uh, caricature, political satire, things were not going well, it's a very troublesome period. I wanted to underline this um, for the audience who is not uh, initiated, because uh, if you don't know about the Ottoman Empire, you might be um, inclined to think that the Great War, just like it did anywhere else, was the uh, authentic turning point when things started to go south, as they say it in English. But in the case of the Ottoman Empire, we need to talk about a lot of violent transformations before the Great War as well. And when I say late Ottoman demographic engineering, I'm making the connotation that I'm focusing on that 11 years, but actually after the Second Constitutional Revolution, there are many transformations happening. All right, so why am I doing a project like this? What exactly is this project? This project is about um, the last part of the title, the Unionist Governors. The Unionist means the members of the Committee of Union and Progress, the harbingers of the revolution in 1909. Uh, I'm focusing on the bureaucrats appointed by the unionist regime once they seize the power in such a way that they're almost unchallenged. In the literature, sometimes this is called the regime of the triumvirate. 
1908, these people are the harbingers of revolution. You might tend to think that they're immediately in power and they are the most powerful party. It's not the case. There are a lot of political struggles going on. Uh, it's a complex chain of events, but only after 1913, with a coup, this party is able to seize almost unchallenged power. And then they start making a lot of appointments. And my argument today here is that these appointments of the governors, Kaimakam in Turkish, are quite significant if you want to understand the demographic change in the empire that I was referring to uh, from 1911 to 1922. So what's my inspiration? Well, there's a funny story behind this. My inspiration is my PhD, but the talk today is not going to have much to do with my PhD. When I was doing my PhD, uh, my supervisor gave me an advice, which I think was a quite good advice. When I was writing my PhD, I was constantly finding new stuff, and I was start constantly asking new questions. And after a while, my supervisor said, you need to stop doing this, otherwise your PhD is not going to end. And one of the things I found when I was doing my PhD has a lot to do with today's topic, has a lot to do with why I think looking at people appointed by a regime that grasped power with a coup is quite significant if you want to understand late Ottoman demographic engineering. But to convince you for that, I need to explain why that's the case. First of all, when I was doing my PhD, I was primarily focusing on the history of a town in Western Anatolia from 19, 1820s to 1920s, so roughly about 100 years. So this was a port town, a photograph of which you can see on the right-hand side, taken from 1913. And this uh, port town, uh, Eskipocha, also known as Palyakokia by most of its uh, Ottoman Greek citizens, who constituted two-thirds of, slightly more than two-thirds of the population at that point in time. Um, this town faced enormous uh, transition, and my argument in my whole dissertation was this transition was from a boom town, a town that's attracting a lot of economic growth, a lot of demographic change consequently because of the economic growth. It was kind of a boom town uh, story, followed by a ghost town story, a dramatic uh, story of destruction, demographic and physical as well. And my dissertation was basically saying that up until the Balkan Wars, 1912-1913, this was a story of growth, but then after the Balkan Wars, due to a chain of reasons, it becomes a story of destruction. And when I was doing my dissertation, uh, I was arguing that this is a particularly reference micro history. What do I mean by that? If you read a book, let's say a survey book, about the transition from Ottoman Empire to uh, multiple nation states, the primary legacy of Ottoman Empire carried by Republic of Turkey, you would see these authors make some um, reference arguments about that transition. For instance, you would see these authors talk about um, how Ottoman Empire being incorporated into world markets is a big deal. You would see these authors talk about how, for instance, nationalisms, multiple nationalist ideologies and nationalists played significant role in politics, etc. My argument was that in this port town, you can see this major arguments playing in a smaller um, scale. So, um, and when I was doing the research of transition from this boom to bust, if you will, but in a quite violent and a dramatic way, transition to a ghost town, transition from empire to nation state, one figure uh, grabbed my attention. And this requires a little bit of an explanation. Sherif Bey is a governor that was appointed to Focha, also known as Palya Focha at that point in time, right after the Balkan Wars. And he was there when the county and the town uh, Eskipoche was kind of the county capital, the largest town of Fochatain, an Ottoman county, which you can see on the map over here, the red area. This, these are the modern boundaries, and the modern boundaries are almost entirely the same with the Ottoman boundaries. This is, by the way, Izmir Gulf. This is Focha I'm talking about. Number one shows you this big town, Eskipoche. Number two shows you a smaller port town in the county. Anyway, when the transition was happening, in the year 1914, that's after the Falcon War, this gentleman is appointed to this village, 
And this village, uh, this town, sorry, experiences it is most significant demographic transition during his tenure. All of the Ottoman Greek residents of this town are forced to migrate at gunpoint by Chetes bandits at that point in time, and they took refuge in the islands in the Aegean, whilst, ironically, a um, negotiation was going on in Athens between Venizelos administration and the Unionist administration, represented by Gaili Kemal Söylemezoğlu, for a possible population exchange after the Balkan Wars. Which, mind you, didn't happen yet, but the Unionists were changing the facts on the ground. And since my topic was Pocha, I was only interested in this person to the extent that he was in Pocha. But when I was doing my PhD, I found out that he served in another Western Anatolian town before Focha, Milas, and there Ottoman Greeks were also forced migrated, not during his tenure, but just slightly before. Then I also learned during my PhD that after his tenure in Focha, this person was condemned by the then internal minister, Halat Pasha, a very well-known Unionist figure. He was taken from his position only to be reinstated as a governor soon in 1915 to Karamursa, northwestern Anatolia, to a place where there were two sizable non-Muslim populations, Ottoman Christians and Armenians, respectively. But at that point in time, I didn't do much about that. I said to myself, I'm going to look at this later. Now, what's the main research question of this project that I'm doing, which I'm talking about today? I'm trying to move from anecdotal evidence to big data. And let me try to tell you what I mean by this. My PhD was finished. I didn't do much about shared faith, but I kept collecting documents about him. And years later, I said to myself, I would like to understand the personal story of this guy in detail. And what I did was I went to the archives and I found a particular source a, a particular kind of source that includes detailed documentation about Ottoman progress, Sijilahwa. And I wanted to find this Sherif Bey that was appointed to Focha so that I can understand what he do, has done before and after Focha. Of course, in a world where there was no surname law, it is very hard to find a Sherif Bey as a Kaimakan because there were many of them born in the same century or get the same century in the same 50-year interval. But after much work, I was able to find it, and I understood that he has a very interesting story, which I'm going to get into detail in a while. But the story was the following. This guy, Ferit Bey, was himself a victim of nationalist policies and demographic engineering from a very early age onwards. And during his career as a bureaucrat, his whole life was almost shaped by demographic policies of competing nationalisms, let's put it that way. And there's one very interesting moment in this career, right before his appointment to Western Anatolia Minas, which I think was a big deal, which I'm going to come into detail. No spoilers yet. But when I saw Ferit's story, I said to myself, is this something that only happened in Pocha and I happen to have this very nice story, or is there a pattern here? In other words, did displaced people, in the case of the late Ottoman history, displace people as well? And I need to explain you where that idea comes from in my case. Faith-based history and what happens in Pocha present a unique case. I taught. After years of research and reading literature about the demographic engineering, I started asking myself, maybe this was not a unique case, but part of a pattern. My question was, was there a correlation between late Ottoman demographic engineering policies and the personal backgrounds of those who executed these policies? Let me stop here for a second. In the literature about late Ottoman demographic engineering, there are already a lot of words about personal stories, histories, eco-documents of the decision-makers. 
that is to say the people who shaped the policies of the uh, Young Turk um, Union and Progress, Committee of Union and Progress. People like Talab, Enver, Cemal, these are kind of well-worked unionist individuals. My focus wasn't that, because very rarely it's the case that the decision makers execute the policies themselves. They take the decisions, but do not do the execution of the policies. What I'm interested in was if people who personally executed demographic engineering policies, displacing people, systematic violence, etc., what was their uh, pattern or background? Is it possible to look at this in big data, for instance? All governor appointments done by the same party for these five enormously eventful years. And again, in a while, I'm going to tell you why these five years for the not a longer or shorter period. And there's one important thing. Correlation is not causal. In other words, if you, in all of the appointments done in these five years by unionists, see a lot of people who are displaced being appointed as governors, and then in those places you end up having more displacement histories, that does not necessarily mean causality. You cannot simply say person A displaced uh, demographic group B because he faced a demographic engineering himself. This is not a cause and effect relationship. But if you see in all, all a point, whatever said, Northwestern Anatolia, this is what we call a strong correlation. There's a history going on here. And that was what I was curious about. And the other thing I need to emphasize, which is very important, is explaining is not legitimizing. Needless to say, if these people being victims themselves play the role in the policies that they undertook, this definitely does not legitimize policies. Our job is not to do that. Our job is to understand how things happen. And there was one big inspiration for me in forming this framework, a book that I hear, uh, read years ago when I started my uh, PhD, uh, a book called Dark Side of Democracy, Explaining Ethnic Cleansing by Michael Mann, uh, that was printed in 2005. And let me tell you why this was a big inspiration for me. Because it gives me a good framework. I have three frameworks in mind when I'm trying to understand if for five years, 1913, 1918, appointment of these quote-unquote middle-level bureaucrats was anything significant or important in terms of what they have done in their position. The three frameworks are the long break war, the cycles of violence, the cycles of violence, and the role of force. And Mann's work was very important for me in formulating the cycles of violence, uh, as I'd like to call it, uh, argument. Mann, in his work, says a lot of things, but there's one quotation that will be helpful uh, for you to understand what I'm chasing here. He says in that 2005 publication, refugee nationalists will be overrepresented in almost all the ethnic and political cleansing movements. In his book, he talks about the Rwandan genocide, he talks about the Armenian genocide, he talks about the Holocaust, he talks about many chapters of demographic violence in his own way. After his publication in 2005, years later, new research came into light, which has strong parallels with what was happening in the Ottoman Empire. Research about how Jewish populations displaced from Europe ended up being overrepresented in displacement policies in what is today Israel and Palestine. Muslims displaced after the partition of India to Pakistan overrepresented in demographic policies of modern day Pakistan. Mainland Chinese Kuomintang members displaced by the Communist Party to Taiwan being overrepresented in uh, demographic policies in Taiwanese history are all examples that kind of corroborate what Ma says. So my question was, this might be a framework. If we look at those who executed most radical demographic policies of the late Ottoman era, we might see the same pattern. We already know this in the level of decision makers. There's kind of a consensus in the literature about that. What I'm looking at is middle level programs. But Michael Mann's thing is not the only framework that I'm using. The other one is 
uh, what in the literature is referred to as the Long Great War. Uh, there are many works that could be given as reference to that. Uh, I particularly like this book called The Wilsonian uh, Moment. Uh, I'm a little bit tired, for some reason I forgot the author's name. Uh, but this book basically makes the argument that if you look at Irish history, if you look at uh, Korean history, Chinese history, if you look at the Ottoman Empire, you would see that the conventional definition of World War I, starting in 1914 and 18, doesn't really make sense. If you're an Ottomanist, if you're focused on Ottoman Empire and Republic of Turkey, you would understand this immediately, because for Ottomans, when there's a ceasefire, Mudros ceasefire, 1918, soon enough, there's a Greco-Turkish war. So it looks like the war wasn't ended on that spot, but it extended beyond it. And again, if you know Ottoman Turkish history, you would know that right before 1914, the Ottomans were already engaged, recently engaged in two major wars, the agreements of which were not still, uh, the, the ink of the agreements of which were still not dry, let's put it that way. Uh, and again, the Irish case is similar, uh, for instance. So the Long Great War is very useful for me because it allows me to understand um, a series of demographic engineering policies within 11 years of events, which in the literature sometimes we treat as separate events. For instance, when you look at the late Ottoman demographic engineering historiography, you would see people focusing on demographic engineering policies that affected Ottoman Armenians, Circassians, Ottoman Muslims, Ottoman uh, Christians of the uh, ethnic Greek ethnic origin, etc., or uh, Jews. But when you look at this in a holistic way, you will see that all of these demographic engineering policies in the Ottoman Empire were talking with what was happening around the empire, especially inter-imperial competition with Russia and competition with the newly emerging Balkan nation states. And when you understand these connections, you automatically end up in this 11 year time period. Why? Because people who took the decision to do this and to execute them on the ground were all shaped by the events of these, uh, what I would argue, uh, 11 years of almost continuous uh, warfare. And again, this is not one random Ottomanist's interpretation. This is these days a widespread consensus in the uh, later uh, shape, uh, modern uh, historiography. Another framework I use, which kind of feeds into what Mann says, the cycles of violence, violence creating more violence and a nationalist competition becoming increasingly more uh, destructive. Uh, I myself had this small contribution to the literature in which I was talking about how this, I'm going to explain that in a second, troubles in the Balkans were kind of um, important, if you will, to Western Anatolia. One of my publications was named Macedonian Question in Western Anatolia, in which I was trying to argue that what was known as Macedonian Question, a question of how uh, multiple citizens of the Ottoman Empire is going to coexist in an empire in a world in which these multiple groups increasingly ask for more recognition and demand for their national identities. That question was kind of quote unquote settled uh, with the Balkan Wars because most of these nationalist movements created independent states and expanded at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. My argument was the Macedonian question was solved, but then the dynamics of that were translated to Western Anatolian uh, seaboard. And I can see no better uh, quick visual uh, testament to what I'm trying to say here. This is a map that was printed in 1914 in Istanbul by a society called Society of Muslim Refugees from Rumelia, meaning all of the Muslims who were lucky enough to make it alive to remaining Ottoman territories after this dark area, which used to be the Ottoman Empire before the Balkan Wars, were lost in around a month's time in a destructive defeat. And then a second war, which did not bring more recovery of the lost territory either. And these uh, Muslim refugees numbered around 400,000 approximately, and some of them were members of the society, and they print this map, 
And the title of the map in Turkish is Intikam, Revenge in English. And the uh, footnote uh, legend area says uh, Rumelian map. Uh, the map uh, says Rumeli in Turkish. Uh, Ottoman territories that used to be a part of the Ottoman Empire before the Ottoman Wars. The white areas indicate major urban areas. And then there's Crete all of a sudden here. Crete was not a part of the Balkan Wars, but it recently unilaterally declared a gnosis with Greece and was lost, and immediately at de facto lost, and then de jure lost. And when it was lost, the Muslim population on it was also forced to be exiled or uh, escape on their own account due to the fact that it was no longer possible to live there securely. And the most interesting part, I think, which supports this quotation here, Macedonian question, moving to Western Anatolia, is this really small detail over here. So there's a person over here, there's a plane, and the plane is dropping books. It's very hard to see from distance, I know. The books are half open when they're dropping from the air, and the book's pages say revenge. And this, at that point in time, was the area with the highest concentration of Ottoman Christians in 1914. And soon after this was published, our Ferit Bey, an inspiration of my current project, the person who I encountered in my PhD, and many other places here, end up forcing Ottoman Christian citizens out of Western Anatolia. The number is roughly 160,000 people. Again, this is no war time. This is the time immediately after the Second um, Balkan War and before the Great War. So in other words, another cycles of violence framework that I use is a peculiar group of decision makers after 1913 for whom displacement is a central formative experiences and the playing super important roles as the party that governs the empire in an unchallenged way and as the bureaucrats were just appointed to places with a lot of Christian uh, minorities. And again, if you're not initiated with the Ottoman history, if you're not very well uh, informed about this, what I'm talking about is 1913 is an eventful year. Balkan Wars is called the Balkan Wars for a reason. There were two wars, 1912-1913. Once the first one is lost, in between the two wars, when the peace was being negotiated, the harbingers of liberty, Union and Progress, Second Constitutional Revolution, who was never in full power up until that point, seizes the opportunity of political uncertainty, stage the coup, the coup is successful. In 1913, they seize the power. And most of these unionists themselves born in the areas that are lost with this war. Let me give you concrete examples. For instance, Jamal Pasha was born in Mytilini. Uh, Talat Pasha was born in Kurjali. And Mar Pasha was born in Istanbul, but he was coming from a Muhajir family of an earlier generations of Muhajirs from uh, Crimea. So anyway, this party's decision makers were also uh, had also experience of displacement themselves, and the bureaucrats, they appointed some of them, not all of them, also had that experience. One final framework that causes me to formulate a question like the one you've seen previous slide, displaced people, displaced people, is it the case? Is coming from not my own field as such, history, but from uh, the field of political science and international relations. Um, international relations and political science has a different way of looking at demographic engineering than we do in history. And uh, this is a one uh, scholar's work, but there are multiple examples that I use in my research. Um, usually in that literature, war, remember Balkan Wars, the upcoming Great War, war is perceived as a force that is transformative on the one hand, and also a force that gives uh, opportunities on the other hand. So it's on the one hand a strategic environment. If you have goals, wars can help you realize them. On the other hand, violence changes people as a decision maker. If you experience war as a person, as a soldier, if you experience war, it changes your worldview. This is my third framework because my argument is just like the decision maker level, mid-level bureaucrats, if in their previous life, before the big demographic transformation starts, if they have 
experience of warfare, this might have transformed them. This might have radicalized them, their worldview. Or, and or, they might be using war as a strategic environment to reach their personal political ends. Again, this is something that is used a lot in the literature looking at similar events in war. So this is the framework. Oh, there's a nice quotation here. A testament to the radicalized language of the post-Balkan war period, this map, that shaped the effective disposition of the decision makers. This is a phrase that I like about effective disposition. Ronald Gregor Sunni, in his uh, seminal work about the uh, Ottoman Armenians, uses this a lot. Effective disposition is how the decision makers, the executioners of particular policies, see the world. What narratives, experiences affect that world? Uh, I think this is a great uh, reminder to us how the year 1914 was, in a way, in the eyes of many people, a very violent political environment in which violence for political ends was, in a way, uh, legitimized in the eyes of the larger populace as well. All right. Um, I need to tell you a few words, a few more words about Ferit Bey's story, because then I'm going to ask if this shows itself in the big data as well. If I need to convince you that there's a pattern here, I first need to define you what pattern I saw when I focus on Ferit Bey's story. Okay, Ferit Bey, in the earlier uh, part of his life, could be described as a successful bureaucrat with quite a good tenure as a bureaucrat. How do I know this? Again, the GDI registers, this is the page we talked about uh, that starts with talking about his father and his work birthplace. Uh, our Ferit Bey was born in 1872, and then also late 19th century in Crete, Ottoman Crete, Candia, now named Iraklion. Uh, he was a well-trained civil bureaucrat, fluent in French, Greek, Turkish, also knew only how to speak Bulgarian. He gets recognition for his success. Uh, these documents are usually, usually very detailed and long. If you read it, you uh, understand that Prominent political and bureaucratic figures of his time gave recognitions to him. So this is no ordinary bureaucrat. This was a, quite a successful guy. However, he experiences um, displacement very early on in his life. How do we know about this? He was born in Ottoman Crete in 1872. Ottoman Crete de facto becomes independent in 1899. He and his family are forced to live this area. And he experiences that, and later on, he experiences the last major Muslim freedom exodus to take place in uh, 1896 and 98. To such an extent, he becomes a voluntary settlement commissioner of the Muslim refugees in Izmir, his next destination in 1899, when Crete, uh, Ottoman presence in Crete is no longer uh, feasible or possible. So, as you can see, a very promising uh, bureaucrat already experiences some sort of displacement in his early career. But the story gets a little bit more complex. The Macedonian question. Remember, one of my frameworks was that if you want to understand uh, demographic engineering between 1911 and 1922, uh, you need to focus on the five years between 1913 and 1918 because something big is happening there. And that big thing is transfer of Macedonian question to Western Anatolia itself. Now, here's what happens with this particular uh, governor's life. Throughout his life, according to Sijid Ahmad, he served in 17 different locations. And six of these locations were in the Balkans, eight of them in Western Anatolia, two of which, Milas and Foce, experiences demographic engineering, two in the Black Sea region, and one in northwestern Anatolia, Marmara region, which will also experience uh, demographic displacement during his tenure. His time in the Balkans coincided with the height of, quote-unquote, the Macedonian question. I can talk about this for a very long time, but let me cut this short. There are many significant moments in the late Ottoman Empire when it comes to the history of Balkans. One example of that is the famous Ilinden uprising. 
He was there when Illinois uprising was happening. He was there when Second Constitutional was happening. These were periods when uh, bandits of, let's say, uh, bandits that supported Serbian nationalist cause or the Greek nationalist cause or the Bulgarian nationalist cause, in the uprising I'm talking about, took the mountains and tried to create these uh, communes that resisted the Ottoman rule. They were crushed, and he was a part of the teams that chased them in the mountains, for instance, as a civil broker. For about six years, he serves in the Balkans between 1904 and 1910. He leaves briefly for a leave and then returns in 1912. I wasn't able to learn what he did in between these two years, although I am thinking that he might have helped uh, Ottoman Italian war in 1911, but I don't have any proofs for that. Now, here are the places that he served. And if you've ever read anything about late Ottoman Balkans, you would be like your eyebrows would be go, going up here. He served in Balgograd, Balgograd, sorry, Jumai uh, Balad, Razlog or Razlog as it was known back then, Yanitsa or Yenice Vardar, Kanti, Iskeche, uh, Sultanieri, Monchigrad, and finally in Kutlech. Why is these places important? All of them constantly had, uh, let's say, Macedonian internal revolution, revolutionary organization kidnapping kids around Razlik, governor Ferit Bey and the gendarmerie together taking the mountains, find it, finding these bandits, sometimes fighting with them and trying to save the person or negotiating with them and save the person. His time in the Balkans, as far as I can see in the archives, is full of taking part in operations like this. And these are operations that included chapters of displacement as well, because sometimes the bandits displaced the civilians, sometimes the Ottomans, uh, targeting one particular village as a village that supports a nationalist cause, displaces the people in that village to uh, create quote-unquote security. In other words, his time in Balkans was a very eventful time, and again, needless to say, after 1908, he is still where he is, which again, if you know Ottoman history, means something, because after 1908, for a brief one-year period of time, if you were not pro-revolutionary, you might have lost your position in the Balkans, the strongest place Union and Progress felt uh, in the empire after 1908. So this is then uh, his story. There's one very important detail that I would like to focus on. The last place that he served, Tikvish, and the last year that he was serving, 1912. Here is the interesting story. When he was serving in Tikvish in 1912, the year at which the First Balkan War broke out, Tikvish was lost very quickly. There was, as a matter of fact, a race between the Greek forces and Serbian forces to capture Tikvish, and Serbian forces were able to capture Tikvish. And they killed a lot of civilians during the capture in the town square, and then they besieged the governor's house, office, uh, during uh, the takeover, and Philip Bay was the governor at that point in time. And he was besieged, and he was taken hostage, and he was tortured. And the accounts of, of his torture are also in international reports. He was uh, apparently so affected by his torture, actually so, he wanted to stop with his bureaucratic positions. He sent a letter. Believe it or not, instead of being, being given a relief, he is actually appointed to Milas, and then to fortune. And that is the story of him, in my humble opinion, uh, which transfers him from a victim to a perpetrator. During his last tenure in the Balkans, Ferit Bey ends up being captured by the Serbian forces and being tortured in his office in November 1912, in June 1913, right after uh, non Muslims there being uh, targeted by non Muslim boycott movement, he is uh, sent there as a governor. Then he goes to Pocha in April 1914. This is April. Just a few months later, in June, this is April, this is June, um, all of the Ottoman Greek population of the county of Pochatain is forced migrated to leave the country. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, the only photograph of a demographic engineering policy taking place. Not ipso facto, not after it, not before it, during what was happening. As you can see in the photograph, there are some Chetan members 
proudly holding their pillage in their hand, whilst in the background there's a French flag of the archaeologist Felix Sartre who took this picture, creating a um, safe corridor for Greeks who are, uh, Ottoman Greeks who are waving their hands for the ships who will soon enough take them to Mytilene, which used to be Ottoman, but was lost very recently to Kingdom of Greece. And then, uh, in my dissertation, I didn't know what he did after this, but for this research, I was able to learn that he was then governor of Karamuset in January 1950. What happens in Karamuset is very reminiscent of what happened in Portia. On the 3rd of September 1915, the Armenian Papaz Nisham of the new village, uh, Yenikarye of Karamuset, writes, Today we are destitute and ruinous in all possible ways since we left our land by leaving all our possessions behind. What I learn and understand is when he was appointed to Karamurset, not only the Ottoman Armenians of Karamurset, but also Ottoman Greeks of the Karamurset were forced to migrate to inner Anatolia, uh, not uh, from Karamurset in northwest Anatolia to inner Anatolia. I know this was a big detour, but this is why I'm looking at big data. Now let me try to rephrase the question. The title of the talk was Displaced People, Displaced People, um, Late Ottoman Demographic Engineering and the Unionist Governors. My question is very simple. Were there other terrorist base in the 2,200 and counting appointments, because I was able to find all of them, I'm very close, I think, to finding all of them, uh, appointments done by the Unionists between 1913 and 1918. And here's why I look at those five years, how I look at them, and what I intend to do, and what I've done so far. First of all, how to set the temporal parameters. Why 1913, why 1918? The argument is, I want to look at refugee experience. I've already told you in the literature, for decision makers like Talat Pasha or Jamal Pasha, this has been argued for. I've used that part, that argument in my own dissertation, but not for the quote unquote middleman. I want to look at these five years because for the middlemen, the bureaucrats that are appointed, these five years were the five years in which almost all bureaucrats were appointed with unionists in full power in bureaucracy. This is not the case before 1913. You cannot easily make the same argument. But after the Union is seizing the full power with a, a coup d'etat in 1913, all of the appointments that they do then become very significant and can be traced back to the person who is appointing, uh, the internal minister who is appointing, uh, recognizing and uh, confirming these appointments. That's why I start with January 29, 1913, the day of the coup. And also, this is also significant because the coup is, remember, happening between two Balkan wars. Some of the bureaucrats in this 2,200 and counting appointments needed to be appointed because some territories were lost. So them being appointed to somewhere in itself doesn't tell us anything. But if we end up having more displacement of Ottoman minorities in the places that they're appointed, then that might tell us something. Now, why do I end in October 13, 1918? For the obvious reasons, because the Unionists are no longer in power. The Ottoman Empire becomes uh, a uh, combatant in, in the Great War in 1914 on the side of Germany, and then they lose the war, and Unionists escape the country, and they uh, leave uh, their power as the sole governors of the country. So appointments done after October 13, 1918 will not be approved by the Unionists anymore. So looking at that five-year interval is uh, critical. Now, what defines the refugee experience? How can somebody possibly understand if a, a you know, bureaucrat has refugee experience or not, or experience with this, uh, displacement? Well, that's what makes this project so slow. Now, first, you need to understand who is appointed. That's easy to do when you go to the archives for these five years. You rank down all the appointments. I said it's easy to do, but it's not very easy to do. But anyway, uh, you need to uh, clean uh, distortion in the data because there are some appointments that are 
repeated again and again in the archives, etc. Anyway, you end up with some 2,200 appointments. What I look at is, what was the previous appointment of this person? What is the new place of appointment for this person? What is the name of this person? And you're not seeing in this screenshot, but in the rest of my large Excel, I have the name of the uh, appointment, the date of the appointment, the document name, etc. Now, my uh, way of understanding the refugee experience is the following. First of all, if the person is coming from a previous appointment that is from a lost territory, they must have experienced the loss as a governor because they are leaving a besieged and lost city. That's number one. Number two, if I know the name and the actual date of appointment, I can go to the Brockrat registers, and then just like I pinpointed out Ferit Bey, I can pin these people pinpoint these people again and see if they have any other refugee experience as well. How many mid-level bureaucrats are we talking about? 2K, 2200 approximately. What are the preliminary findings? So far, there are 33 plus one Terit Bay, 34 in total, Terit Bay-like appointments. But here's the thing. There seems to be a pattern here because all of those places, as far as I can tell so far, also experienced displacement. So not every bureaucrat appointed is um, of a displaced background, but if a displaced bureaucrat is appointed, there seems to be displacement happening in the place of appointment as well. Now, of course, I have to double check most of this again before this turns into a publication. But my preliminary findings is that what we see in the middle bureaucrats does not contradict but corroborate an already existing macro argument, which I very hastily quoted at the beginning of this thing about other demo chapters of demographic engineering uh, in the world history. So uh, this was my presentation. I was, I hope I wasn't speaking for too long. This was supposed to be 50 minutes or so. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Emre, for this Thank you for having me. presentation and also the well-framed project that you're conducting. Uh, so the Rolls. As the party that comes... Uh, 30 minutes. Um, I can start with uh, my question. Okay. If you don't mind, because uh, I have uh, a couple of them. Uh, you still talk with, so uh, in a way it's fine. But again, thank you again. Uh, the first question I have is about, uh, you know, what these guys themselves wrote down about the experiences mm -hmm. that we talk about. Uh, because we know that these this generation of bureaucrats, administrators, were interested in writing their memoirs. Are you planning to look at those memoirs or have you looked at those memoirs? Do you think you'll find some reminiscence of their past experiences and making connections with those experiences with their policies? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a question about the sources. Mm -hmm. The other question I have is about the methodology. Uh, it's great that you are also looking for similar case, cases. How about Counter example. Control group. Uh, or control group. Yeah. Um, maybe you can juxtapose a figure who ran a pretty wild demographic engineering without that sort of background. So that you can yeah. enrich the narrative, you can establish a nice contrast between a case like David Bay and another case in another problem yeah. without that sort of background. Um, thank you. Both super nice comments and questions. Uh, about the sources question, uh, this is why I love to talk about this topic, because in my fantasies, some other Ottomanists focusing on this tells me, oh, I know this person, he wrote a uh, memoir. Because the problem is, when they're appointed, we don't have a surname law. When I go to Sijil Ahmad, that I can do with appointment dates because Sijil Ahmad's appointment matches the appointment here. 
But that doesn't still give me any idea about the surname. And most of these people, as you know, if they wrote something, their writing is published after they die with a new surname law, surname given to their family. So in the case of Fred Bay, I really struggled so hard to find something else outside Sijin Ahwal, but I wasn't able to. Will I find anything else about these 33? I'll try, but so far I haven't uh, been able to do that. But again, uh, I think, um, you know, uh, if my colleagues already know about, let's say, I don't know who is appointed to be this, if somebody knows something about Sabri Bay, then we have something there. Um, but that's not my priority right now, uh, because this in itself is such a big deal. Pinpointing the guy and then going to Sijil Ahwal, and then you have multiple Sabri Bay, Jedi Bay, Safed Bay, you need to again understand which particular one is your guy. First, I need to finish that. But a great contribution. Um, thank you. The control group thing, definitely yes. And once and hopefully when it turns into a publication, there'll be that side of the argument too, definitely. But again, remember one emphasis that I made, correlation, not causality. If I was saying they did it because they were refugees, then nothing what you said would have been an agenda. I'm already very cautious about what I'm doing here. This is a correlation. And Mon does that very clearly. Too. Not all policies against uh, Jews during the Holocaust were engineered by people who were displaced Germans. Most of them were done by people who weren't displaced Jews, actually, the Germans. So that I definitely know. And that will be a part of uh, the project when it's done. Uh, but again, this is. Uh, correlation focus, not causality focus at this point in time. But thank you again. If you're saying this, it reminds me that I mustn't forget that uh, towards the end of the project. I have a question about the third and final. So you mentioned it's like 2 pounds approximately 32 similar fashion on the 22,000 so mm -hmm. far. And uh, so um, I don't know if like it's uh, being able to like, access the, the population like the before and after uh, like those times uh, the following the third uh, but, but in the ballpark I'm just saying um, how, how much of the population do you think the there could be um, growing is sort of affected or like the employment of the displaced people do you think um, you have a sense of the um, what percentage of the population was displaced, or were there more uh, like larger catastrophes of uh, people being displaced than other parts of the end? I'm just curious. Um, very good question. Uh, percentages, uh, I'm super careful about numbers. Uh, you know, I can't say anything right now because I need to finish all the 33 other. But when this is over, we'll be looking at hundreds of thousands of people affected by. Uh, governorship period of these people, let's put it that way. And never forget that, um, well, first, in the case of Fed Bay, when Ottoman Greeks were gone, uh, Minister of Interior uh, punished him by relieving of him of his duties for not being able to send the gendarmerie to protect the Ottoman citizens from the Chetes. But then he the person had condemned the governor, appoints him again to Karim Musa, and the same thing happens. So let me underline this uh, one more time. It is not necessarily the case that when these people are appointed and demographic engineer policies happen in their tenure that they do it. In the case of Fayette Bay, I know that he didn't stop it, and there are a lot of strong clues that uh, he might be inclined to do so. Doing that same thing in that detail for the 33 other, that's why this project is taking so long. Because you need to make sure what you're saying is accurate. Um, yes, proportion-wise, I think we will, if all 33 are similar stories like Fed, Fed affected 15,000 people. Um, so if you have 33 uh, people with similar stories, we're looking at a couple of hundred thousands of people affected by uh, this more or less. What was your other question uh, about the? You said there was a question about the percentage and another question. I'm like, are you gonna ask like, in terms of like the call, the series of displacements again? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think do you have a feeling that they're gonna hold us 
uh, these volumes are going to be responsible for like the big chunk of it, or? Oh, yeah. They are, okay. Proportion of these events in the proportion of larger uh, demographic engine. Again, I need to see when it's done. But I think uh, there will be significant cases because some of these people were appointed to places like one with this, the uh, Arabic, this is this is the populations with very significant uh, Christian numbers, especially Armenian Christians. And these places, as we know, after 1914, are heavily impacted by demographic engineering policies. So there will be probably cases that are uh, very significant, like Ted Bay's case. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, demographic engineering is a term I like, uh, and it's less used in history than it is used in political science and international relations. It includes all sorts of policies uh, that uh, decision makers impose on demographic groups. That could be forceful displacement, violence, um, birth control, um, forcing people to work for some works but not others. All of them are considered demographic engineering. Some demographic engineering policies are purposefully designed for an end. Some demographic engineering policies end up creating a very negative result, which the power uh, holders do not see or uh, seek to understand. In the case of Focha, I know for a fact that this was what I call in my PhD organized chaos. You look the other way when something super significant is happening and the outcome of that is aligned with your political goals. That definitely is the case that happened in Focha and I kind of wrote a lot about that. For the other 32, I have a strong feeling, based on what's written in the literature, that I'm going to end up in the same place like in Forcha if I want to something. It will probably be the case that when the uh, demography of Anatolia was being re-engineered by the Unionists because they had that for various reasons, military reasons, security reasons, ideological reasons, they wanted to re-engineer Anatolia. Uh, and then uh, these people are appointed there and if something is happening, and there'll probably be political will uh, behind it. But we need to speak case by case. That's a very uh, contentious issue in our field. We need to uh, really talk about place by place. Uh, because some violence in a war environment is uh, sporadic and spontaneous. It's never planned. Some of it is spontaneous. You can stop it. You choose not to stop it. And some of it is just outright uh, planned and uh, engineered in a way. And we definitely have a combination of all three in these five years. Uh, hopefully when this is done, there will be also a GIS output of this, ge geographic information system output of this, showing where governors are going and what's happening there visually as well. The gentleman over there had a question, but... Uh, well, thank you for an engaging talk. I have a couple of questions. The first one on the correlation versus correlation point. Mm -hmm. um, when you're saying this, so are you suggesting that not all appointees who were displaced displaced other people, or among the subset of the displaced appointees, this displacement wasn't a formative experience that caused them to displace? Because there are like some. Uh, terms to the court to have that formula to mm -hmm. or shape affect the position or to define it then. So what type of like what's the definition of correlation mm -hmm. there? So the second one is more about the methodology and it stands in part like I just keep hybrid training and science and I just science and uh, science great. and maybe we would talk like in both languages. Uh, I like the like the figure is weird, but I was wondering if you are Planning to use specific, even statistical tools, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and science there's the use of the key value, but the underlying philosophy of it has to do with patterns that would occur beyond randomness. Mm -hmm. And I would argue these underlying philosophical notions could be applicable even to human politics. 
I think so. Yeah, yeah. And I think there might be a chance to extend the to some extent to a human policy. So, 33 out of 2,000 extremely noticeable, but are you planning to make quantitative methodology mm -hmm. to that question? I'm, I'll start with the last one. Mm -hmm. I'm very tempted to do that. Uh, I'm currently doing another project, and to answer your question, I need to tell you what it is. With the help of a computer scientist, I'm using associated rule mine, association rule mining, uh, which is an algorithmic uh, method to understand how events occurring seemingly independent from each other occur at the same time uh, in a large data set. For instance, association rule mining is usually used in supermarket research. When you buy milk, you also buy the cookie. So what I'm doing in that other project is there are 13 biographic categories of all the members of the parliament that entered into the Turkish parliament from 1920 to 1950, 30 years. Question is, these 13 categories, when passed through that association rule mining algorithm, there are certain correlative association strengths that you see. Knowing one language, being graduated from another school, marital status, do these correlate with how long you serve? or if you ever appointed as uh, the chamber, head of chamber, or as a minister. Same logic, I think, could be carried to these 33. Uh, but um, you need to understand one thing. I don't know if you're, not, if you're a social scientist or not. Social scientists are a little bit allergic, allergic to these things. Uh, so first, I need to run through these cases, I feel like, anecdotally one by one, and then talk about data. If I immediately talk about data, I might be perceived as somebody who is talking about a grand tragedy in numbers. But first, I want to understand every case one by one, find uh, whatever is in the archives, and then maybe talk about correlation. I might be criticized for that, but that's kind of honestly where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm trying to uh, do that. And the previous question was about formative experiences and such. Uh, what's my framework here? Um, I don't think I can say, even in the case of Ferit Bey, like this guy was born in Crete, he lost his homeland. Then he had an experience in settling other refugees to Aydın province. Then he went to Balkans for years, literally chased bandits in the mountains. Then he himself was tortured and uh, was then appointed to another position. I cannot say all of this combined is the reason why he did torture. I simply cannot say. If I could have said that, that would have been a causality relationship. But like Punch warned me, if in the rest of the group, the representation of being a part of demographic engineering policies is so little, but in this so high, that I might be onto some correlative relationship. Uh, then, then Michael Mann might be right in that sense. It's what he said, remember, over-representation of refugees in radical nationalist projects. That's what I'm trying to uh, do. Uh, and the, my formative experience definition is, was this person a part of the moment of loss after the Balkan Wars as a governor, plus other things in his personal story, as far as I can chase them from the bureaucratic registers. I hope this was helpful, but uh, if it's not, please keep on asking. Uh, what was this experience uh, of being displayed by those type of times, uh, not provided? Uh, and uh, published in the third between uh, 1920 and the Balkan War uh, 1930. Mm -hmm. uh, so, were there any uh, memoirs published? Or, uh, memoir, I would, yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice question. Um, there are already scholars that work on what is in the literature called. Ottoman war propaganda. So most of the pain and suffering of displacement experienced by displaced Muslims in the Balkans 
was usually used very heavily uh, after the Balkan Wars and during World War I uh, as a propaganda, as a means to legitimize demographic policies against the Ottoman Christians. There are already studies that show us that NGOs, if you can call them like that, uh, you know, the displaced uh, Romanian Mohajir's uh, organization, political parties, the Unionist most notably, and others, use this story in their own political writing and agenda. So there's that. Um, do we have uh, memoirs? We have things like, uh, you know, uh, Mehmet Rishid Shahin Giray's uh, eco documents uh, when he was, you know, he passed away. We have things like that as well on that level, on the high decision makers level. But again, I have not yet found a memoir of a governor of this, mm -hmm. this size, let's say, this, this level of bureaucracy. Uh, but I know their stories were used in newspapers and also even in parliamentarian minutes. Uh, these were issues that were discussed. For instance, there are many parliamentarian discussions in which what the unionists are doing in terms of demographically reshaping Ottoman Empire is discussed in the parliament. And it is often the case one or the other unionist says, well, we have been exposed to this in the Balkans. This is the age of nation states, no longer the age of empires. We need to do this and this. These were parts of uh, the parliament's language at that point in time, if, you're, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, please. And thank you for this very interesting research. I'm really curious to see um, that out of 2000K appointments, did they commit also similar displacement in their area? And um, if so, like I was wondering, uh, could this be uh, rather a bigger, you know, trauma of loss, trauma of war, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, uh, being displaced and then displacing? I don't remember exactly on top of my head, but there was this book about it that uh, the war trauma was so big that uh, for the later period of course it affected how they you know responded to certain events. <laughs> Might definitely be the case, and it's a question that I have in mind too. But for this research to finish, I need to keep that question for a later time because you're definitely right. For instance, let me give you an example that was in my mind when I was in writing my PhD. Gerard Bayer is never displaced as a person himself or his family, but he plays an enormously significant role, especially in Western Anatolia, as the person representing the party when an anti-Christian boycott is taking place and then the displacement of 160,000 individuals are taking place before the Great War after the Balkan Wars. He is Katibi Mesut of Aydin province and is in the primary. There you go. You already, we already have stories like that in the upper decision-making level. You might have a similar story uh, in the mid-level bureaucrats as well. Um, but I want to divide this question into two. First, I want to focus on uh, people who had this experience, whilst not forgetting what I was being warned about, the control group, like you say as well. I shouldn't forget that when I'm finalizing this, but looking at everyone, I would never be able to finish this. I mean, looking at two K governors individually seeking out their uh, bureaucratic registers and then seeking out if they have any ego documents published. For that, I need a ERC or something like that with a lot of bad power. Yeah. There is an important uh, historiographical and theoretical concept in Italian microhistory studies mm -hmm. called exceptional normal or normal exception. And it sounds oxymoron, but you know, sometimes you have a very unique case, an exceptional case, but at the same time, that exceptional case represents a bigger phenomenon. Uh, I mean, Italian microhistorians usually use that concept in the absence of substantial evidence mm -hmm. for their study, because they usually work with medieval or the modern yeah. so the sources that, you know, they can only find just one good example of a certain figure, and then build a broader argument based on yeah. that thing. Maybe we can use a concept like this. I mean, in addition to all the digital humanities and its, uh, you know... Uh, shenanigans. Uh, yeah, shenanigans. <laughs> You can also have recourse to 
that sort of yeah. theoretical discussion yeah. in the microhistory studies. Uh, thank you. I didn't know about that concept. I definitely should look at that concept. And please let me know about the details of the publication as well. Um, I think fair based story in itself is, by the way, already a big deal. Uh, so I'm trying to do something about that, him alone, in terms of a publication. But I have this gut feeling that it's, he's not the only one. If he's, and if he is not the only one, I want to find that out. Um, especially uh, among the other uh, appointments that I was able to uh, pin down. Um, but then again, uh, what was the term you used? Exceptional, Exceptional moment. moment. Yes. This, I think Ferret Bay is alone and except. If this was medieval studies, I think if we had Ferret Bay's full story like I have, it's a good exceptional moment already, I think. Uh, but I still have a strong feeling there will be others here. Uh, and see, even Sigil Ahmad will help me understand most of their background very easily. Okay. But thank you, that's a very useful concept. <laughs> okay. I can, I want to ask something. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but you know, I will just limit myself with two, I guess. Uh, a very interesting research. I mean, uh, you have to be very patient, you know, I guess it's, it's a lot of data, whatever. I'm not a historian, so I admire when people do this kind of thing. One thing you had a quotation from Papaz Nishan. Uh, so, mm -hmm. do you uh, do you use Armenian sources when you work on this, like, or, or where is this from? Do you, do you... Um, as a matter of fact, this is a funny story because Tunch helped me with this. Uh -huh. He remembers that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> this was years ago when I was doing my PhD, and we were all doing our PhDs. I had a lot of resources, and that was one word that I was able to read here. This is from Ottoman Turkish. This is from Ottoman archives. And as a group of scholars, which was among the group, and he helped me with that, the pure coincidence. This is from uh, Ottoman archives. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at the Armenian uh, sources, which might be there in the uh, in case of uh, church records, for instance. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to double check with, as you know, very seminal works about what happened to Ottoman uh, Armenians in this period, kind of Kevorkian kind of works. Mm -hmm. There's actually a mismatch in what I know to have happened to Karamursal Armenians and some other studies. But to be honest, I know two things for a fact, and for this research, that was enough. A, they were definitely displaced. Mm -hmm. This is one uh, example of the fact that it happened. The others are, we know what happened to demographic numbers in Karamursal because unionists counted them after 1915 as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And since I'm focused on the uh, governor, that was kind of enough for me. Uh, yeah. One thing I mentioned because uh, if you mentioned Kevorkian, Raymond Kevorkian's work, yeah. I was the one who uh, who translated and you know edited his work in, in Turkish. Uh, his uh, his uh, you know uh, previous work that was published seven years ago in Turkish. So when I was working on that, I had uh, compiled, for example, in Armenian literature, Armenian you know historical literature. There is this. Uh, phenomenon called Kushamadians, you know, like, like when you have uh, these survivors who were uh, displaced and to Syria, survived, went to other places, and then they, in 20s, 30s, 40s, they prepared books dedicated to their hometowns. Kushamadian mm -hmm. is translated like album, book, book, whatever, but which contains memoirs a lot. And I read most of them, and there are like more than 250 of these. Like, there is a Kushamadian dedicated to whatever small village, Nahiye, whatever, you know, like you have right. more than 250 of them. And Kaima comes are one of the uh, figures that they talk constantly, consistently about them. So Kaima so did this, Kaima did that. Sometimes they have friendly relations, all of a sudden they become enemies. Sour. Sometimes Kaima comes even convince some Armenians to help him to get rid of Armenians in his, in his uh, you know, place of appointment. So it might be an interesting source for you to look at, and some some of them are digitized, so you can just, you know, even type the name of the Kaimakam and then maybe find, you know, uh, information in these, uh, and they're like very rich, you know, like uh, if, if, you, if you find uh, some of them. Another question I had, so we have like these bad guys here who did bad things, but also recently, in uh, you know, especially in genocide literature, I mean, in genocide literature, people wrote about the ones who rescue exactly. people especially so yes. maybe if you find like a figure uh, among your people or your guys who actually resisted the orders you know like 
despite the fact of being in the turtle tree. Maybe that's even going to be the case. Yeah. I yeah, need yeah to because recently Gu Ching actually published a book, Akintia Karshi, by mm, I heard about that. Yes. You know, rescuers, you know, who resisted. It might be interesting who was displaced, who witnessed, and then, you know, in the case of your hero here, Perit Bay, who, who went through tortures, but who also resisted and saved people in his new yep. you know, mission. I don't know, maybe it might be interesting too. Both your interventions were very good for me. Thank you very much. I knew about the Tromadian before. I should have remembered to look at that as well. Definitely, thank you. Um, because uh, I didn't know them to the extent that you do, but it has information about Kaima comes that must be something that I need to look at, especially for these 33 appointments. And yes, uh, there might be stories in which people are against the current, like the book that yeah. you're referring to. Um, that's why I said pre preliminary findings. Mm -hmm. I know my Focha, I know a couple of other places, even about them I don't want it to talk about in this presentation because I want to exhaust all resources before I say something conclusive. Mm -hmm. For Focha, I can easily do that. For the 33 other, I've hauled it, let's say, but now I'm learning that I have looked at the <laughs> Armenian side of the sources, which I would have because there are appointments in this one and other areas, as you know, which mm -hmm. uh, had prominent Armenian population. So there must have been a council of Kaima comes in that region. I'm happy to help you. If you need help, you just let me know. I'll be knocking your door. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Well, on that note, then, well, thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes. Also, yes, uh, thank you for having me here. And also, one thing that I have to say, thank you for all the students that supported me in my undergraduate research projects dealing with this large chunk of data. Without their input, that would have been possible. Thank you for that. Okay.